Let's consider this quote for a minute. Let me just give you a few moments of silence to read this and, and let that sink in for, for a minute and I'll provide a connection for us. So this quote from Brene Brown's Dare to Lead was brought up yesterday in the statewide school improvement convening that, that brings a conclusion to the year of school improvement activities. And it was presented by Dr. Tyrone Howard, who was our keynote speaker. And he challenged us to see the opportunity um, as we look to reopen schools that are presented to us with reimagining systems. And we took a we took a very hard look at what that meant if we're going to have meaningful conversations that change systems so i bring this quote to the table today uh, so that we can think about how even when we talk about educational technology access we're talking about removing barriers and attempting to create equity access so that students can reach their full potential. Let me take that a little bit further uh, and I'm gonna do a little, I'm gonna channel my inner Dana Anderson today and provide some uh, introductory comments. I wanna cover a few main points with you. I'm gonna encourage you to be proactical, give encouragement and grace, build competence in order to build confidence in those around you and communicate seven times seven ways. So let's talk about each of those really quickly. So most of you uh, that are here know that I'm a former English teacher. I love words, words with multiple definitions, words with multiple connotations, puns. I love it when somebody uses an incorrect word on purpose, but it works like when my son asks for the sweep when he's requesting a broom, which he does. So I thought it appropriate to start by introducing a new term to you. And that word is proactical. And my invitation to you is to be proactical. Let me explain. I'm gonna pull apart this word into three words you're gonna easily recognize. Proactive, tactical, and practical. School leaders and most teachers I know find comfort in planning that's proactive. We plan with the end in mind. We construct mission statements, vision statements, and goals to guide our actions. We perform needs assessments in order to identify areas we must address in order to move toward our desired outcomes. And appropriate use of educational technology can help you and your teachers maintain a proactive stance. Tactical is a word commonly associated with uh, the military. Uh, as a small aside, it's also a word associated with all sorts of gear marketed to people who watch outdoor shows on television so they can feel prepared to face the outdoors. But I use it today for its other meaning. To be tactical is to plan for an end beyond immediate action. Being tactical means planning with the end in mind. And current and former teachers can relate to being tactical because I'm sure each has backwards planned a unit. So educational technology can make tactical planning more efficient and more effective, okay? And finally, let's tackle the third word. Educational technology integration is ripe with um, multiple meanings of, of practical. Um, first, tech has practical applications assisting in the forward movement of teacher practice and student learning. It is perhaps more practical to use a Zoom meeting to hold a conference, for, for example, rather than a telephone in order to see and use body language. Second, tech is hands-on and it's likely to succeed in assisting users when it's applied with skill as a feasible solution to a dilemma. In that definition of practical, we find that tech is practical because it's suited to a particular purpose. The last definition 
The practical I want to present with regard to tech is this adjective. So nearly the case that it can be regarded as so virtual. And look at us practically live in this virtual space. So I challenge you to think about how ed tech can help you and your people be proactive as you plan for and then reopen schools in fall of 2020. I'd like to connect this a little bit to uh, the Brene Brown. Some of you have had conversations with others and maybe yourself about uh, all the opportunities that are currently presented to rethink systems that previously seemed so natural because we've just been doing them for so long. And many of you um, maybe are also thinking about how we stand on the brink of a new era where we can do a better job at leading with equity in mind. Proactical use of tech can remove barriers to learning and help teachers meet the needs of a student body that's increasingly diverse. Let's dig a little bit deeper for a moment into that equity piece. We're in education because we love kids. Uh, we believe in them. We believe in outrageous hopes and dreams on their behalf. We yearn to provide them with skills and knowledge to fulfill their highest potential. And um, each person in, in my team, in the teaching and learning team here at ESD 113, believes that proper integration and use of educational technology will provide a more just, equitable, and accessible educational experience for students. Uh, students who have been marginalized, students with disabilities, students who identify as Native American, students who identify as Hispanic and Latinx, students whose first language is not English, students who identify as Black or African American, and students who identify as LGBTQ+. And that's not an exhaustive list, but we believe that appropriate use and integration is going to provide us an opportunity to move closer to equity, constantly moving down that road. So if we're gonna be proactical, we've gotta be ready to insert ourselves in uncomfortable spaces. And with that, let's, let's move into today's journey. Let's start being proactical and uh, let's see where this takes us. Let me be practical, proactive with you with regard to um, uh, two of these other concepts really quickly. Giving encouragement and grace, building competence to build confidence, and then communicating seven times seven ways. I want to talk about the middle two. We, when we interact with teachers in the conversation around continuous improvement, and when we interact with each other around continuous improvement, we find uh, comfort in what's familiar. And so our first practical and proactical recommendation is that you start to provide teachers with the knowledge that they have existing competence to be confident about. So when we're talking about how to support teachers as we start to plan for reopening, and we think about, I'm unsure if we'll be in a hybrid model, an offsite remote learning model, or if my school will actually have all people on campus, and we don't know when the Department of Health might shift those things for, for us. We need to think about how all students and parents and teachers will be returning to school having experienced a traumatic event and series of events. And I'm not just talking about how we needed to close schools for everyone's health for, for coronavirus. I'm talking about the images that we see of civil unrest in our country and uh, the, the, the disturbing uh, things that, that we have that we're wrestling with as we face our own privilege, uh, as we face systemic racism. 
students and teachers are both going to come back needing our support in social and emotional areas. So one of the first steps in planning might be to break down something that we know, like the TPEP state eight, and say, look, friends, everyone's coming back to school, to a learning experience, and we need to attend to relationship first so that we can set the stage for where learning can happen. And that means that we need to think about criterion five and criterion one. We already know that when we are on site, criterion five and one, five about fostering and managing a safe, positive environment, and one, demonstrating high expectations for children. These are about procedures, routines, a welcoming physical environment, ease of access throughout the classroom. It's about teacher-student relationship, understanding interests and backgrounds, dispositions of dignity, empathy, grace, rigor, those are things that teachers know, that we know, and with our planning teams, as we prepare to provide people with the competence to give them confidence, we need to ask some questions. So I propose moving through questions for each of what is the familiar TPEP state eight. Let me continue with the example for C5 and C1. Questions for your team. If we are engaging students in a remote or distance learning model for all or part of our time, how will criterion five and one remain unchanged? What doesn't change? How will teacher actions and behaviors look the same when we're on Zoom, for example? when we make a video and post it, for example. How teacher actions and behaviors look different. And you can help people start to visualize what the behaviors are that will exemplify meaningful relationship building, meaningful instruction, meaningful assessment by engaging everyone in the conversation around that and then providing them that competence to give them that confidence. So I propose moving through each of the aspects of TPEP state eight. So if we need to attend to relationship first in environment, so we set the stage for learning, then we probably need to talk about what does criterion two look like in structure? How do we attend to meeting individual student needs, criterion three? How do we form assessment routines that are, have meaningful checks for understanding? And what are the technologies that allow us to connect with groups of students and individual students so that we gather the information we need to inform our teacher next steps. All right, so as we're preparing for continuous learning in any one of our three models, I propose that you provide people with competence and a voice so that they can have confidence. And I know the last one was seven times seven ways and uh, this is just one way that I'm saying these words out loud. They were also on the screen. Those are two times, but I've said it once. Okay, let's move on. Let's talk about what to expect from the rest of today in plain talk. We are going to surface these issues for you. We're going to talk about and make you think about removing barriers to instruction and learning going to talk about and make you think about selecting and integrating educational technology into planning and instructional routines. We're going to 
talk about increasing capacity and confidence for all when using ed tech. And we'll always have in our mind launching school with the assistance of educational technology in the fall of 2020, regardless of whether you're on site, hybrid, or remote and distance learning. This is what we're going to talk about today. And if we're going to talk about those things, I, I don't want anyone wondering what we are saying. So I, I want to introduce three vocabulary terms to you right now that are important for our conversation. One is this term synchronous. A synchronous event is an event like this one. We're all here right now in real time experiencing this synchronously. An asynchronous event is an event that is pre-recorded and prepared. It's an interact with it when you can type event. For example, a pre-recorded video we would share with you to watch at any time. When you go and look for a TED talk that you wanna use with your staff, you're looking to interact with that TED talk asynchronously because it has been previously recorded. And finally, I want to introduce the idea of a core four, and we're going to go into some detail about it. This is about simplifying. We're going to talk about a core four of a home base, storage, synchronous tech, and asynchronous tech. All right. So there's some basic vocabulary for you, an introduction and a practical way to get people involved in thinking about what competence is needed to bring everyone confidence. And we're on the precipice of something that can be really exciting. Get in there, be willing to get messy. So let's move down the tech road a little bit more today. Let me introduce to you uh, Daniel Kent, who is based in Grays Harbor. He's a regional coordinator for mathematics and teacher support. And Daniel's going to uh, tell you about what our stick figures are thinking. Daniel, take it away. Thanks, Russ. Um, so, so far, Russ really kind of introduced three key terms for educational technology integration. Um, and before myself and Lindsey Drake um, talk about sort of what that core four is and why it's so important, we just want to acknowledge the amount of complexity and the amount of information that we know that teacher and district teams have to wrestle with when considering how learning systems really need to be designed when we move forward. Russ will go ahead and advance. So we have these sort of these big buckets of thinking that we want our teams thinking about. Um, educational technology standards, the SAMRA model for educational technology integration, our own content standards, universal design for learning. We're going to kind of hit a number of these as you go on throughout the day, but we want those to be the big buckets of thinking. And then we start to layer in all of this other technology, um, some that you've heard of, some that you know very well, some maybe you don't know what it can do. But when we start thinking about really that massive list of educational technology tools that we have access to, we can see how our districts and our teacher teams will really start to wonder, how does our team sort out and make sense of all of this? We start to think about how all of our big buckets of thinking, not quite yet, Russ, sorry. We start to think about how all of our big buckets of thinking might blend together in our instructional planning. And we start to see that districts and teams really need to create a common model to follow to serve as a vehicle to help navigate through the wide range of tech tools and allow teachers to focus on how to incorporate those high leverage best practices into those tools. Really districts need to identify a set of baseline technology tools that provide all members of the system with clear and consistent access to learning. This is what we refer to as the core four, which we will talk about and take a closer look at in just a moment. But before we do, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to Lindsey Drake to talk to you about you know, why it is that consistent platforms across districts are really just so critical to the success, success of educational technology systems. Thanks, Daniel. So we have a million platforms out there that we can use. 
And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about rationale for using consistent platforms in your district and why that might be important. So we don't know next year what the year is going to bring. COVID uh, certainly surprised us this year and we had to make some quick shifts. But next year we could be in um, any kind of model at any given time. We could be in a traditional school model. We could be in a hybrid or blended model where we have some kids coming some of the time. We also could have to shift again to complete remote or distance learning. And when we do that and make all those changes and shifts, we have to be able to flex and function and not break as a district. So it's important that we're using consistent platforms for our students and families, if we look at it through their lens, for our teachers and for administrators. So with students and families, we want them to be able to easily use the tools that we provide. We want them to be functional and able to access those easily and know what they're doing. They can also support and train each other on the tools. I know um, I've certainly gotten some calls from friends. How do I do this with my child? Can you tell me about how this Zoom thing works? Um, what, do, what, do, what is my teacher using Google Classroom for? I've gotten those phone calls and I've been able to try and support and train some of my friends, but if we're using similar platforms in our district, then people can call, text each other, and help each other out as well. And we want the focus to be on learning for students. We want to decrease their frustration with the tech tools, and we want them to be able to focus on what's happening while they're engaging with those tools. And we're preparing them to be digital learners in the future, so we want them to have a positive view of technology our students to have a positive view of technology. Uh, I have a kindergartner and he is already proficient with using Zoom. He knows how to mute himself. He can start and stop the video. And that's because we've been consistently using it for a while now. If we look through the teacher lens, we wanna keep focus on best practice. And that best practice needs to be about how they're delivering content, whether it be social emotional or instructional content, we don't want them to worry about what tools should we use. And I'm sure you've heard many teachers want to use their own tools. Um, I can understand that. I have my favorites too. But we know that that can cause some chaos and confusion if we've got a lot of teachers using different tools and parents not understanding how each one of those work or students not understanding that as well. Um, if we're using consistent platforms, we can have more powerful collaboration among our teachers. We can collaborate on how we're using them, on lessons, on how we're getting messages out to families. I know I've worked with several teachers this year who are brand new teachers, and I can't imagine starting my teaching career in a situation where we've suddenly had to shift to this distance learning. But one thing that's been beneficial for them, especially when they're using a core four tech that is the same, is they've been able to collaborate with their team and feel supported and feel like we can deliver something that's best for students. Um, additionally, we can provide similar professional development for teachers. We can train everybody on how to use those tools. Our training can be a little bit more in depth and helpful so that we can make uh, access for our families easier. And then if we're looking through the administrative lens, we can team better with all stakeholders if we're using consistent platforms. Call to the district office from parents. I don't understand this. How do I use this? Well, that's easily answered if we're using something that's similar rather than teachers using their own platforms. It also supports equitable practices. We know that it's a challenge to deliver services for some of our most vulnerable students. And 
using the same platforms helps us figure out how are we going to deliver those services for our students. And one thing that always rings a bell to me as a former administrator is it's cost effective. We're not buying licenses or purchasing things for different platforms, but if we're all using the same ones, often when we have more people on those licenses, we get a discount. Or there's free platforms out there too that we can use and train everybody in. And then finally, it opens up for clear avenues for communication among our staff, our families, and our community. And we can get those important messages out to them and get that instruction out there and show that we are being supportive and continuing our efforts to educate our students. I think that one of the big things is a lot of times when we're making these shifts, we're in crisis mode. And we need to provide some consistency in the time of crisis. And one of the ways that we can do that is to use similar platforms for synchronous, asynchronous learning, home base. So they'll provide continuity for everyone and we can make that shift easily to any model that we need to. So with that, I'm gonna send it back to Daniel and he's gonna talk a little bit uh, a little bit more about the core four and what each section entails. All right, thanks, Lindsay. Um, so I was just thinking about seven ways, seven times seven ways. Um, and in just this presentation, I think you've heard these terms at least five already. Um, so some of this will be familiar. You, you will have heard these terms before and that's intentional so that now you can start to think about, you know, what does this really look like? in our district. So the core four is essentially, it's a set of district identified tools that are common to all buildings. And there's des really designed to help remove barriers for learning and promote those deep levels of collaboration, both across contents and grade levels. The first tool that we have is what we refer to as our home base. Um, this is where all that content for learning appears for students and families. It might be something like Google Classroom, Schoology, Class Dojo, Canvas. There are others that you probably have heard of and might be considering using. A, a common home base really allows students and families to have that one single access point. Parents know where to go. Older students know how to support their younger students in navigating that tool. It's really that consistent piece of communication that families and community members need to feel successful and connected to the school system. The next thing we look at is the storage system. The storage system works directly with that home base tool. It will house all of those materials and resources that teachers will use for instruction and that will be posted to that home base. Your storage system might be something like Google Drive or OneDrive. Um, Canvas actually can be used as, as its own storage system in sort of the, the background of it. Um, it's important to understand that a common storage system that works with a home base is what allows for much higher levels of collaboration between teachers. And that's really true whether they're doing it on site or from a distance. We need to start holding a collective sense of responsibility for all the students of our system. And we need to develop content that will not only better engage our students, but that can cut across content areas and be accessible to a wide range of students. Having that common home base and shared access to materials allows those teams to build off of each other's work and improve the learning experience for all students. Our third and fourth tools are two different types of video applications that really serve two different purposes. One is for synchronous video. Districts might choose something like Zoom or Microsoft Teams to meet this need. The synchronous video is for connecting live with students, family members, or staff. This is how those relationships and classroom cultures are developed and maintained in distance and hybrid models, where face-to-face -face interactions are just not happening daily. Even if we do return to fall with that face-to-face -face learning, we need to be finding ways to intentionally incorporate routines for synchronous videos into our classrooms. In the event that we have to make a quick pivot into distance learning, we want those routines already established with students so that they know how to 
properly access that material and can use it for learning and not just be a tool they have to learn later. Our final tool is used for asynchronous recordings. These are three to five minute pre-recorded videos of a teacher that is connecting with their students on a regular basis. And then these are posted to the home base for access. This is where that new content is actually delivered. It's also where students might be able to record their own video to submit in an, as an assignment in distance or hybrid learning, or even really potentially in traditional school models. That idea of using video as evidence of learning is something that we need to make a shift towards. Screencastify and Flipgrid are two examples of what that asynchronous video might be and that a might, district might select. You'll notice that when we look at the whole system, on the outside, our diagram has space for additional technology tools in home base, synchronous video, and asynchronous video. Your storage system really is just that. You won't be looking to add on tools to that because it just houses everything you're working on. Um, but eventually, teams might start to think about how they can start incorporating pieces of other technology into their tools. You want to make sure that your teachers, students, and families really have a strong foundation in what that core for is though before adding these in. The final point I would like to make is that when districts develop that strong core four model, it relieves teachers of the burden of having to sort out which technologies fit where. And instead it can focus on how to integrate educational technology standards, universal design for learning, content standards, multi-tiered systems of support, all of those best practices into their instruction, whether they're in person or using it through technology. Thank you. And I think now handing it back to Russ. All right. So that was an introduction to some new terms for many of you, but for others of you, that was just a re an opportunity for reinforcement of what you've been hearing. And many districts have already moved in this direction. They've had conversations about how we can create consistency across grade levels, across schools, with regard to the number of platforms and software we are asking teachers, students, and parents to interact with. So the conversation about simplifying the number of systems that we rely on and that we're asking people to interact with is key for an equity lens. So there are a couple of uh, questions that I noticed. One is about um, the idea of if, if we don't have everyone in our district with access to the broadband access, um, we struggle. And so some places will struggle with trying to conceptualize a plan that is a hybrid of we have some students who are able to engage via remote and distance learning while other students are not. We want to ensure forward progress for all groups of students who are with us. So how do we then help all those groups? And I think that what we need to do is start by asking teachers to identify those essential content area standards that need to take priority in the course of the teaching year for 2020-21. One thing we need to recognize and help teachers recognize is they will not be able to get through all the content if they are to create a plan for how we can provide those who do not have access with meaningful learning activities, as well as those who do have access. And of course, if we're on site, then we talk about what are we doing when we're on site. 
uh, we also are going to be, we're, we're making an argument today with you that some people need to relieve themselves of systems that they may have used for a long time in order to provide a more simplified experience for students and parents. And that can be hard. I'm one of the people who I still have a wiki for those of you who remember what wikis were. And that was my home base and my storage. And so I would be asked in this environment now, perhaps to move and migrate to a system that would be consistent with the rest of my school. And that can be a difficult conversation. So another one of those difficult conversations that needs to be had in the name of equity and access. Awesome. All right, well, perhaps there was a little bit of awkwardness so far. And we just wanna take a moment to recognize that as you travel together with your teams down the road, we need you to embrace the awkwardness. Uh, our own team has embraced awkwardness. I do wanna mention that there are over 600 people that are enrolled in ESD 113's Kickstart the Restart series. It's a series that starting in June goes all the way to December and talks about how to integrate educational technology and think about ed tech to reopen the schools successfully and then enter into planning and instructional routines that are meaningful in fall. And we've had some hiccups in our first few sessions. We plan so carefully, but you need to embrace that awkwardness. Mistakes will happen, tech will break down, and you need to move forward, okay? Routines also will provide your teams with the competence they need. So as you think about what the core four platforms might be for your district, we also need to be thinking about how our district provides support to our people in how to use those platforms well in their practice. That provides them with the repetitions and practice they need to feel confident, okay? And once again, teachers aren't going to get through as much material. We need to move them through a process to identify essential standards and get students talking. Many of us began long-term school closure bringing whole groups of classrooms of students together on Zoom, and we were disappointed in wondering why everyone wasn't engaging. It doesn't take an adult long to understand how and why that happened. So we need to talk about if we are engaging part or full time in remote learning and instruction, how do we leverage our use of technology to make individual and small group teacher student connections in order to personalize the connection to the educational process? That puts deposits in the social emotional bank account through those relationships and as a leader, you can help them gauge and recognize their own emotional state so that you can see what your teachers need, they can see what their students need, and you create a through line that travels all the way through how you're interacting with your building leaders and teachers and what you're asking of them to do through their interaction with their students. Let's do a quick look back at where we've come. So one of the things we want to do with this, and I'm Andrew Hickman, is with the reopening schools, we wanted to provide you with resources and activities that you can do with your staff to help you embrace the awkwardness, to help you go back and reflect, to see exactly where you've been. Um, these are things that you can do with your staff. And I wanted to show you one resource that we're going to be providing and then also how the results can look, which can help with those conversations, which can help with you build that system that you need to look at supporting. So Russ, could you go ahead and let's look at the protocol. So we're recommending that we do something like a three, two, one protocol where you ask your staff, think about 
three positive changes that you've made since the beginning of long-term school closure. Okay, once again, we're trying to think positive. We want them to be able to start those conversations because with our staff, we also need to be building that culture where they're gonna be feeling comfortable with this. So what are three positive changes you've made since the beginning? And then we're gonna go into two areas that need to be modified, adjusted, or reevaluated. You should get their opinion. You should get them talking and say, well, we tried this. We weren't able to reach all of our students, but we attempted this. We were successful here, but we may need to reevaluate here. We may need to adjust this. So let's hear what they have to say with two areas that need to be modified, adjusted, or evaluated. And once again, we're starting these conversations so we can build a plan of support. And one more, Russ. And then what is one shift that you haven't made yet? What is one area that you feel we need to grow? And once you get your results, your staff may be able to start these conversations to help build a culture and you can see exactly where they need to go or where they want to go to make this best practice for students. So this is a looking back protocol that we have used with our over 600 participants. And I wanna show the results of how this looked and why this is beneficial. And you will be getting this resource. We're gonna be giving you everything that we have so you can do this with staff easily. So Russ, let's go ahead and look at these results. I wanted to highlight how powerful these conversations can be. So we sampled 661 educators so far in Kickstart the Restart with this protocol, the 321. And these are some of the things that kept popping up. These are some common responses. So what are some positive changes that you should celebrate, that you should feel that your districts have done since the long school closure? Number one, more teachers are embracing technology. As an ed tech person, that makes me feel very good inside. Just letting you know. And we've seen it. We've seen teachers who may have been hesitant in the past because they didn't feel they were comfortable doing it. They're now embracing technology and trying new things. I've even heard most of the teachers say, even when we go back, I'm gonna continue using this tool because of the things that are happening. Number two, the second positive change, they brought our building teams together in a good way, which reflects on you as district administrators and leaders in your district. You were able to bring these communications really evolved around my students. How are we going to impact student learning in a new way, in a new model? And you've had those conversations and it's reflecting in this data. And the third positive change, teachers are really thinking about how to engage students. So thinking about engagement, thinking about how are we going to increase their learning, thinking about different ways we can do this that we haven't seen before. Okay, so those are some positive changes that you should pat yourself on the back with. These are things that are overwhelmingly, 661 educators have said they've seen. Two areas that may need to be modified, adjusted, or evaluated. Finding more creative ways to teach content so students stay engaged. Once again, they're thinking positively about how to make their students more engaged in any environment. And number two, finding a different way for students without internet connections to connect with classmates. And a lot of the stories we're hearing is people are driving to houses and delivering packets. We're still trying to build those relationships and make sure students are being engaged and finding different ways. I know that companies and different grants and things are getting out there and they're starting to be recognizing that we need to find ways to connect and hopefully this will help improve in the future. And one shift, and this was powerful for us to hear that hasn't been made yet, from emergency remote learning to effective, sustainable, scalable distance learning. So we went into this at a rush. We had very little notice, we had very little warning, not a lot of us were prepared. But now we're thinking about ways to improve in the future on how we can make this sustainable and scalable. And part of that was because of those positive changes that they saw above. They're seeing that this can work, that we can't have a new way of thinking. It's just, let's try to figure out the how. How are we gonna get this to work? How are we gonna make sure all students are engaged? Okay. Next slide, Russ. And so with that, I wanna pass it to Jen, who's gonna talk about how we can look ahead based on what we heard from our teachers. 
and actually, and actually you're passing, passing it to me. me. Oh, thank you, Lindsay. That's okay though. Um, so looking ahead, we've had the chance to look in the rear view mirror and learn from the past a little bit. The, the toughest part, this completely unexpected shift is behind us and we've learned a lot from it. So now moving forward, looking ahead to the next school year, we don't really know what's coming next. We got some guidance from OSPI that um, we're all trying to read through and make sense of and decide what's best for our districts. And we can see the road ahead, but we can't quite see exactly what is coming next. So we may at any time be in different models this next school year. So we might be in a traditional school setting at some point during the school year. Russ, can you go ahead and, and click ahead? And that may have some social distancing guidelines or, and or masks with it. We might be in a remote learning or distance learning setting again like we are now. And we could be in a hybrid or blended model, again, where some of our students are coming at, at different times and shifts. We're not really sure what that might look like. So we have to be able to pivot. And like I said before, Greg Bamford, if you were in the Shifting Schools training, um, provided an article that talked about designing for the next school year. And he had said, School districts need to be able to flex function and not break. So we need to be ready to do that no matter what model we're in. So if you think about our car analogy, we might have to slow down, speed up or turn unexpectedly during the next school year. Uh, he also talked about one important piece to that is being able to provide some consistency and comfort for our students through systems, rituals, and practices that we can keep the same no matter what model we're in. So we asked folks in the Kickstart the Restart training, teachers, principals, everyone in there, what is something that they could keep consistent no matter what school model we are in next year? What is something that you can do in all three models? And that is going to increase our likelihood of success if we're able to keep some things consistent no matter what. So you might reflect on that a little bit later and think about, okay, no matter what kind of structure we have, what system, ritual, or practice could we keep the same to help provide that through line or that continuity for our students? And next, I'm turning it over to Jen to talk about potential barriers to providing those through lines and that consistency. Comment. I was typing in the chat, and so now my comment's going to be on hold. <laughs> um, so far, we've talked about three positive changes that have been made since long-term school closure and two areas that need to be modified a shift that's yet to be made, and a system or a ritual that provides consistency for our students. As we're thinking about all those aspects, take a minute uh, to reflect on what you identify as your biggest barrier to one shift that needs to be made. In our Kickstart series, we invited the same 661 educators, 426 of them were in our first session, and 135 in our second session and they shared their biggest barrier that they perceived in making the shift. And so I'm gonna invite you to take a minute. This is the first one. Um, see what things stood out to the educators in the sessions. It was students, access, internet, participation. Russ, could you go ahead to the next slide, please? 
Sure. Can I make one uh, interjection at this moment about mm -hmm. the largest word on this screen, which is students. And so for those in our audience who see that we ask them for a perceived barrier and you know how wordles work, the word that shows up the most often is the largest. You may find it a little dark that the word students, it was the most uh, produced perceived barrier. But really, I think that the spirit behind the word students in this case is that the, the range of needs to which we must respond on behalf of our students. That's, that's really the spirit behind what students is in this case. I just wanted to mention that in case people were like, what students? So <laughs> let's go to 135. This one, a different group. Again, students and the range of needs, exactly like you were saying, uh, is something that is one of our challenges. The smaller words represent some of our outlying challenges. You may see paraeducator, you may see um, home, participation, parents, uh, overwhelmed, um, involvement, all of these outlying challenges Matt, are out there as well. Do any of these, as you look at them, do they match concerns that you may have had or concerns that you may not have thought about yet? So if you haven't had a chance, take a minute. You can take a screenshot of this if you'd like to use the snipping tool um, or you can, we can share it out later. You might consider asking your staff to create a Wordle like this. We used a system called Poll Everywhere that's an add-on in Google to create this one, but you can also use other apps like Mentimeter too. Um, your challenge that you're thinking about may not have risen to the top and may not be the larger word in our word cloud, but it is going to be significant to the work that you do and the work that your teachers do with the students. Uh, Brene Brown, in her book, Dare to Lead, asked team members to paint done. Um, and her idea of painting done is to paint what finished might look like. What is our goal? And it unearths expectations, and it also unearths unsaid intentions that we have. It fosters curiosity and learning, reality checking, and ultimately success. What does it look like to provide equity? What does it look like to provide access? What does it look like to have student engagement? If we paint done and paint what our goals are, then we can work towards those goals effectively. Second lens that I'd like to introduce you to is to frame barriers in terms of how might we. How might we provide student engagement? How might we provide family support? Uh, Dr. Ron Baghetto has shared uh, a couple of protocols on possibility thinking. And by framing it in possibilities, we flip our assumptions about the issues and we can consider different opportunities and different vantage points that help us find promising or different ways about issues. And those can impact the range of solutions that we discover. Um, I think one of the most interesting aspects of possibilities, when we frame them, inside of possibilities versus recommendations, possibilities seem endless and they're also non-threatening. And so they can be something that can be considered, worked through, and then used or changed. So we can turn those challenges into our innovative solutions and remove barriers. And Russ, could you advance to the next? Anyone who knows me knows that I'm a big reader. I probably read like five or six books at the time. <laughs> um, this slide uh, comes from a book called The End of Average by Todd Rose. And I learned today that if I hold it in front of my face that I can share a book. Uh, but Ted, he, it's written by Todd Rose and he also did a TED talk on the same subject. And there was a story that introduces this book and it resonates with me because not only because of the story, but also because I'm an Air Force brat. Um, and a brat is a friendly term. It's a term for children raised in military families. So my dad was raised in, in the Air Force and served for 20 years. Um, so this story resonated with me because of the context. Um, in the early 1950s, the Air Force was piloting planes um, and the pilots were reporting back that they were hard to handle. Um, and after some is it the pilot? Is it the trainers? Is it the plane? They undertook a study to measure 4,063 Air Force pilots 
in the hopes of finding the average size. And they did it across the 10 attributes that you see on your screen. They thought these would be the most relevant measurements to performance. So they have 4,000 pilots that they're measuring a group that is already predefined and pre-selected by the Air Force because of their ability to fit in their existing cockpits. In the chat, make a guess as to the average group, how many of the group you think would fit across all dimensions, all 10 dimensions. There's 15%, 0%, 30%. 25%, 10%, 11, 5, 20, 0. Are you ready? Zero. When they designed for average, zero of the pilots met all 10 criteria. There was not a single one. So then they reduced it to just three dimensions, three criteria. Only three and a half percent of the pilots would fit within the range of the cockpit they designed. It seems almost intuitive design, to design for the middle or to design for the average. But instead of designing a fixed experience, what if we could adjust it? And what if we adjusted the seat? What if we could push or pull the steering wheel closer? It's still the same cockpit, but we're changing it. What if it had a universal design that allows it to flex for different pilots? Longer legs, there's no problem. We have foot pedals for that and we can adjust the seat. Longer arms, let's put in a movable steering wheel. So as a result of the study, the United States Air Force began to fit the system to the individual and not, or fit the, began to fit the system to the individual and not the individual to the system. And we have an opportunity right now to adjust some of that same thinking and education and remove barriers for our students. And so I'd like to leave you with a couple of questions of how will we include voices from traditionally marginalized groups and technology and in training, in training our decision-making processes? And how will we ensure that our processes and decisions remove barriers to quality instruction and student learning? At the end of the presentation today, you're going to uh, have some resources and we'll introduce you more into universal design for learning, which help, is an approach that helps to optimize learning for all students and for teaching based on how we know the brain develops and how that works. And UDL is a, a lens that can help you with teachers to look at the why, the what, and the how we deliver that as well. And I and Andrew is going to tell us more about how this can work with digital age learners. Thanks, Jen. Can I provide a little transition for you, Andrew? Sure. Awesome. So you may be wondering, you know, this said educational technology, but the second part of our talk for today is, and continuous learning. And that is why we're addressing both of these topics, educational technology and continuous learning, as well as the integration of both of these ideas how do we apply and think about educational technology in order to ensure continuous learning? So this is why we're hearing this group of people not just continue with tech talk, but we need to talk about learning, continuous improvement for our teachers and students. So what we're doing now is we're going to make a shift and pivot to talking about digital age learners. And when we do this talk, let's keep our mind toward not only the students, but also what we're asking of our teachers. Because with competence comes confidence. Andrew. Thank you, Russ. So when Jen was talking about the myth of average, she was introducing an idea that we need to really be able to be flexible and work with our students um, and use universal design for learning. Now, one of the things you have to do to be able to do that is really get to know your students and who they are. And one of the ways you can look at them is around the concept that they are digital age learners. And this poster here is actually entitled, I am a digital age learner. And this has different characteristics 
that embrace what a digital age learner is. So I wanna quickly just go through them. And in your head, while I'm reading through the descriptors of what a digital age learner is, think about your students. Is this something you want them to be? Is this something they already are? Or is this something we could build towards? So let's just go from the top. Digital age learner is an empowered learner. This is someone who sets goals, works towards achieving them, and demonstrates their learning. Digital citizen, they look at rights, responsibilities, and opportunities of living, learning, and working in a digital world. Knowledge constructor, they critically select, evaluate, and synthesize digital resources in a collection that reflects their learning. Innovative designer, they solve problems by creating new and imaginative solutions in a variety of ways. Computational thinker identifies problems to work with data and step-by-step -step processes to find solutions. Creative communicator, they communicate effectively and express myself creatively using different tools, styles, and digital media. And global collaborator, they strive to broaden my perspective and understand the world, how it works effectively in a new digital system. So for me personally, I find those attributes, those characteristics of a digital age learner, something I hope my students can strive for. And I think about the world right now and what's happening. And if we have students that are global collaborators or creative communicators or digital citizens, then we could have solutions for pretty much any situation. And so the nice thing about these is this is what we want to teach towards using digital tools, resources, educational technology. These are what our students can be or are. And as teachers, we can embrace these as well. Now, there's another reason for showing this. Russ, could you advance for me real quick? Because those can help support removing barriers. When we look at them, those titles, empowered learner, digital citizen, knowledge constructor, innovative designer, computational thinker, creative communicator, and global collaborator are actually the educational technology standards that we use K-12 that are broken up into different grade bands of appropriate use of technology for students. So, to help remove barriers, we need to think about our digital age learners and their characteristics. We need to look at best practices for using educational technology. We can look at educational technology literacy, not only for students, but us as educators as well. And there's a reason for bringing that up in a second. We can look at integration into all content areas and how to use in any environment, traditional, blended or hybrid, remote or distance. So we can build upon the I am a digital learner to work in any environment. And we also need to look at removing barriers for access, which I know is a problem right now. And I know there's possible solutions happening. So those define our educational technology standards, which we can build towards. And here's why. So Russ, can you go to the next one for me? So one of the ways to remove barriers is looking at integration. We said that on the last slide. This is one model. There are many districts have adopted different models. This is one model that we use to help define what different levels of integration looks like and help support removing barriers for teachers to know that you are integrating technology when you're trying different things. Because one of the barriers is in our own heads. I'm not a tech person. It's the same concept as I can't learn math because I don't have the math gene, okay? So this right here, SAMR model, has broken into four levels, very similar to Bloom's taxonomy, very similar to the DOK, depth of knowledge. And I wanna briefly talk about them. So the first one is substitution. Substitution is a direct substitute using tech, but there's no functional change in the task or activity. In my head, substitution is virtual textbook versus a traditional textbook. You can look at it on a screen, 
you can look at it in paper. There's no functional change if you're just looking. But then we go to the next level, augmentation, where it's still a substitute, but there's some functional improvement. For example, using virtual textbooks again, they can now in the virtual textbook, click on a word that they don't understand and read a definition. Or they can increase the font on the screen. Or they can click on a math problem and it takes them to a video, teaches them how to solve it on the spot. That's augmentation. So there's some improvement using technology versus not. But then we go to the next two levels, which are transformation levels. Modification, there's significant task redesign. I'm gonna tell you with our emergency remote situation, most of us were thrust into using modification. Google Classroom to send out announcements, to send out work. Canvas, we're building courses on the fly. Schoology, looking at the different ways to lay out our problems. Modification we were doing in this system because of the task being significantly redesigned. We had to change our thinking of how we address it. Using the idea between synchronous and asynchronous, I'm going to deliver a video live through Zoom is modification. We're doing modification right now. As well as we have an asynchronous video you can watch later that gives instructions, that gives the background details on your own time, which you can rewatch as much as you want because you made a missed a step. And then the last level is redefinition. Redefinition is because of technology, this is now even available. It's now possible. One of my favorite samples comes from our region and they had students write poetry. We've all written poetry before. But instead of just writing poetry, they uploaded the poetry to a website and became instantly published authors. The parents in the community then purchased the poetry and they were selling their work. So we have published authors selling work, probably never defined and think about the power for that student. They're now recognized authors. Okay, so redefinition because of technology. So the SAMR model is just a way to think Oops. about integration. You're good. So why is this important? Well, part of Kickstart the Restart, we have something known as the audit tool for educational technology, which you're gonna get access to as well. We want you to have it to use it with your district. In the audit tool, one of the questions we ask is revolving around integrated technology and the professional learning or supports they receive at a school to be able to do this work, to understand the lens of educational technology integration. The data here from 304 responses, there's more this morning, not everybody has responded yet. It's asynchronous work, so it's not due at the same time. We have 70% that say they either have had little or no school district support for teachers to plan educational technology integration with professional learning, or they are regular yet brief school support for teachers to plan educational technology. Now the question we have is, how is it being prioritized? Are, if you are providing it, what's happening? So this is from teachers saying that they are hoping to receive more support with educational technology and availability to do it. And there's different levels of learning just like we have in the SAMR. Are they learning the tool, which is a key step. We have to know how to use the tool to be able to do this with students. Are we learning how to integrate into content areas? What is our problem? What are we working on? So this is just some really heavy data to look at, but it's where they're looking for support. And we've heard nothing but positive comments about they're excited to move forward. So very happy about that. So how are you going to remove barriers? We've given a lot of information to you. And so this slide talks about some questions you might want to think about in removing barriers for integrating technology with your staff. I'm going to read through them because they're powerful. So questions you can use to think about how to remove barriers. Number one, what is the biggest barrier the team perceives for providing equitable support to all students? You looked at the Wordle and you saw the different things, technology, access, students. What are your perceived barriers for equitable support? Two, where are you preparing staff on how to integrate educational technology in any environment? What are you doing with your staff to prepare them to be able to integrate technology? Okay, where are you at? 
and everybody's at a different pace. Three, how close is our district to establishing a core four? Now that we've introduced the core four, how close are you to actually having a district wide one? Or what is your philosophy on it? What are you doing? And the fourth one, what are our action steps to show we are responding to our largest barrier from spring 2020? With the long-term school closure, what are your action steps? What is your plan? What's coming forward? Now, to support you with this, we decided we wanted to do something to give you resources and access to dive in your own understanding and learning, plus tools you can do with your district. So we're gonna show that. Russ, did you wanna add anything before I go into this? Uh, not at this time. Okay. Um, but when we're done kind of sharing with them, oh, this, this tool, this particularly powerful tool, we'll give them their break and then we'll kind of walk them through the other, the other tools. So for us to help support you, we thought the best thing we could do because we only have you sure for a short time today and we may not see you for a while, please feel free to contact, of course, is provide a choice board with resources, training, materials, things that you can use with your staff things you can do in your district to help you move the needle. So if you have a smartphone, and if this is easier for you, if you open up your camera on the screen, so here's my phone, on the screen there's a QR code. If you scan that, it will take you to this choice board. Or you can have this link, and we're gonna post the link in the chat. Okay. So the link is posted in the chat. Feel free to take a picture of the screen as well. And this is also in the folder for opening school. So you'll have access to this at any time as well. Russ, do you want to go ahead and click on the link for me now that it's been shared in the chat? So the choice board, when you access it, you will have a view only access. Now the power of view only is that you can still click on the links. So the links are live, you can click. The first thing I want to address is at the very top in the gray. The very top in the gray is the audit tool. This is an audit of our education district's educational technology integration. The first link is a training that Russ created that trains you on how to use the audit tool. Now the audit tool goes into the entire system of educational technology integration from looking at choosing technology with the core four to training technology to looking at the educational technology standards to UDL and looking at all students, okay, to communication. So the audit tool is a complete tool to use with analyzing where your district's at and different ideas for moving forward. So what would the next level look like? What does the next level look like? Then we gave you access to the audit tool below that, which is a paper copy, okay? Um, and it's just in a grid format. If you wanna just print and do on paper, that's great. But the final one we gave you is access to take the audit tool in a Google form, which is what all of our participants in Kickstart have done. So we have over 600 responses to this audit tool, which means a lot of the teachers from your districts, anybody that's taken Kickstart has access to take this tool. And we're going to take that data and sort it by district and make sure districts get it. So if you want to take the digital version on Google, you can go ahead and do that as well, and we can get you your data. Then we broke down the choice board into three different categories. The first one is educational technology. So these are all three sources tied to integrating educational technology with your district. The first tab, the first square, is around the standards. So the I am a digital learner. So the first link is an overview. It's a training. It's a quick 12 minute video, a little longer than I wanted, but still on how to look at the ed tech standards, which provide grade band, so K2, what does it look like in K2, who's doing the work, with resources, with examples of what it looks like in the classroom, and samples of how it connects with other content areas. There's a poster and there's even a music video. So those are all links available to look at the ed tech standards with your staff or yourself. The next one is uh, some of my favorite videos around SAMR. So those integration levels, once again, your district may have a different integration level tool, that's fine. The third one is around the core four. Okay, so Daniel once again made us a video on explaining the core four. And then Lindsay created a planning tool on how to 
look at the core force selected in your district and what you can use it for in a traditional model, a hybrid blended model, or a remote and distance model. So there's a planning tool with instructions on how to use it there. And the last one is tips on how to make good videos, how to make powerful videos for students. Jen, would you mind talking about the resources with removing barriers in UDL? Sure. Um, the first one is a overview, it's a five minute overview video on CAT from CAST, um, which is the center that does most of the work and is the hub for universal design for learning. Um, and it's a great tutorial on the three different domains of that um, approach. The second link is a great video um, done by Shelley Moore, uh, which she talks about the 710 split. She compares inclusion to uh, bowling um, and how when we uh, have a 710 split, that can be the most difficult shot to reach those outlying populations. And it's a, uh, again, a five minute video that can help frame the conversation about reaching for the margins. Um, the TED Talk, The Myth of Average, uh, this uh, is uh, Todd Rose talking more about how we, when we design for average, we actually end up designing for no one. Um, and so he talks more about that. And I thought that would be, uh, again, when you're in front of your teams and working with folks, that might be helpful to share. Uh, how to give student feedback. Uh, this is a, a, one of the questions we have seen a lot, or I've heard a lot working with teachers, is how do I give feedback to students in this um, era of doing remote learning or being uh, distance learning. So how to give that feedback. So this is a gr an excellent site. This is actually a higher education resource, but all of the strategies and responses on this page are incredibly helpful no matter what the grade level. Thank you, Jen. Mm -hmm. And the last one, the activities to use with teams are activities that we felt could be powerful if you were doing a PLC setting, a virtual setting. They all work virtually as well as in person. If you wanted your team to do that three, two, one looking back protocol. Where are they at? Get that communication started. We need to get them talking. The next one, three ways to rename problems to find innovative solutions. Okay, great conversation. How might we question? Okay, another great protocol. And then how might we team activity? So we wanted to leave you and provide you with activities to do in your district because we got you for an hour and a half today-ish. Um, so these would help you move the needle with educational technology and support you in your own learning and professional learning. Okay, Russ. Let's try and get back to our slide deck here, folks. Actually, this is our last slide, if I'm not mistaken. Right. And we're going to send folks to break. So what I'd like to invite every, uh, everyone to do is take a break, full 15 minutes, will go from 10.25 to 10.40 for break. When you come back, we're going to, to show you how to access these tools and state again how they can be powerful for you. And then we're going to uh, engage you with the folks who are also logged on in your district. If it makes sense at that time, we're gonna look at the numbers. And we'll start a question and answer um, portion as well. So we'd like you to take a break, come back so you can hear more about the tools that we're leaving for you, and then we'll move into a more interactive portion. All right, let's pause the recording and we'll see everybody at 10. All right. And you are recording. Thank you and welcome back. Um, what I've done is put on the screen for you the tool uh, that we just talked about that has embedded tools. And these are resources to move the needle. As we were on break, we were talking about how we could use all kinds of analogies here. This is a launch pad. This is the initiation stage. This is so many different things. And um, we really believe that starting with recognizing that we're presented with opportunities for equity and bringing powerful learning uh, to our students, whether we're on-site, off-site, hybrid model. Um, this is where we wanted to start, that having the voices in the room to ensure that 
we are building systems, procedures, and protocols through an equity lens is, is so important right now. And I began the day by saying that we are going to facilitate thinking that will spur meaningful action. And we hope that we presented compelling questions, compelling ideas, um, compelling suggestions that will cause you to convene your leadership groups and engage them in a way that examines what's appropriate for our students and our teachers. How can we demonstrate through our interaction with them what we want to see from their interaction with students? So this is a fantastic resource. Um, I wanted to talk about two additional resources before we move to our more interactive time. Uh, there are two services. We are, we are an educational service district, ESD 113, and we provide services. And so I just want to mention two particular lines of service that can help you in your conversation. The first service line is managed by Andrew Hickman, and it's a program called EdTech Plus. And EdTech Plus is an annual district subscription that provides folks with a few things. Let me walk you through it. 24 seven access with training for ProQuest and InfoBase online resources. And we give that to all staff members in the district via an ESD media portal. So it's a single access logon. Professional learning for district staff or teams, if you need be, on EdTech integration. Free seats at EdTech Plus professional events for your district staff. And what I mean by that is, if we hold a Google Classroom training that is just a standalone Google Classroom training, like Advanced Google Classroom, if your district is a member of EdTech Plus, the district can send as many people as they want or as many people in the district can access it without paying the fee that would be paid by people who are not members of EdTech Plus. If we offer a, um, for example, the series that we're doing now called Kickstart the Restart, current members of EdTech Plus, the staff members in those districts accessed that entire series without paying the fee because their district is a member of EdTech Plus. But EdTech Plus is more than that. It provides leadership support and networking for leaders in districts so that we can build district and region-wide capacity for appropriate ed tech integration and moving our teachers toward becoming digital age instructors at the same time that we're moving our students toward becoming digital age learners. So once again, that's a key service and support that, that we provide through an annual subscription. The second of the two that I just want to mention is that we have in-house UDL and MTSS experts who can provide consultation for you. We can help you diagnose existing systems, analyze strengths and needs, and build plans for continuous improvement. And I think we all know that um, our, our level one MTSS is going to really need our close close attention in the coming year. And when I speak MTSS, I'm speaking of those tiered systems that support students academically, like RTI, okay, that falls under MTSS. I'm speaking of behavioral supports, so PBIS is under the MTSS umbrella, and also social emotional supports under the MTSS umbrella. And we know those are gonna be so important. Let me um, turn it back over to Andrew to see if he would like to walk us through anything more to share about the place where we put these resources for you. And so for that reason, I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen for a moment so I can get poised for that. And we're about to get you into a little bit of an interactive mode. All right, Andrew, I'm ready to show them the folder. 
which is not the right folder at this time. Let me invite you to show them where we've put that if you want to show that to them. And I'll invite you to share your screen for that. So within this, um, you have been added to the reopening schools folder. Inside the reopening schools folder, you're going to see our presentation. So this entire slide deck is here. Um, when you click on that, you should be able to view it. Uh, you can always make a copy and tweak it yourself. That's fine. And then the other one is a link to view the reopen schools choice board. So both of these are in the folder from the reopening schools. So if you were in the overall reopening schools piece that was provided to you, um, you can click educational technology and the two main components are there. Inside the choice board, if you open this up, once again, you have access to the link with all the other resources available uh, that you can go ahead and use with your district. You can take these, view them, learn from them, etc. cetera. Okay. As well as uh, Jen has posted in the chat our four main questions that we recommend you do with your staff or the people involved with you today. And then once again, we posted the direct link to this choice board. Thank you very much. So we just want to reiterate that we didn't want to load up this Google folder with a bunch of stuff. What we wanted to do was provide you with two key pieces that will be the launch pad to other conversations. So the first launch pad is the choice board. Because in the choice board, we have our embedded links to other tools that will assist your conversations. The second piece that we included in the folder is the slide deck. So you can use that as a review tool, remind yourself of what kinds of conversations and prompts and thinking you want to engage in with your teams. Um, let's see, I'm gonna do a little bit of spontaneous with my group right now. Uh, team, shall we send them to, as best we can, district rooms to come up with a couple of questions that they might like to ask us? So, um, we're going to break you into breakout rooms and to the largest extent possible uh, where we see that multiple people are present from a single district, we're going to put you in the same room. But where we have uh, participants in today's Zoom who are just uh, here on their own, we're gonna group you with a few other people. When you're in your breakout room, 10 minutes, just have a conversation, free 10 minutes, and I'd like you to identify a question or two that the room has that you'll bring back to us after the 10 minutes are up. So we're going to give you 10 minutes, free conversation, anything that you've heard today, and then come back with one question for the main session for us um, that your group had, and we'll address that uh, when you return. So just to give an awareness, um, if you did not name yourself with your district. <laughs> I have put you with other districts that need at least one other person. So mm -hmm. just be aware, you may not know the person with you and that is okay. We wanted to make sure there was at least two people in a room. And so good help. And I will be sending in about 30 seconds because I'm almost done. All right. So. What I just want to do before we go to the breakout rooms is remind everybody that it's very important when you get to the breakout room, I'd like you to unmute yourself and show your video. These are indicators the, to the other people that you're there, you're ready to engage. And at the very least, you need to unmute yourself and alert people that you are there. If you have stopped video and you're muted, we do not know if you're standing at your computer or if you are doing something else. <laughs> so when we get to our breakout rooms, uh, really we want you to unmute, introduce yourselves to one another, and then have the conversation um, so that we can do that. I see a lot of people are, are show, starting to show their video. This is great. Thank you very much. Good to see Rick from out in Aberdeen this morning. All right.
Good to see Stacy from Yelm. Excellent, excellent. All right, folks, we're gonna have 10 minutes free conversation. And then as that 10 minutes wraps up, we'll send you a notice. Come back with one question that the room had for us. Okay. I'm ending. Somebody was on another Zoom. I heard it. There we go. I see them going. I was able to get pretty much everybody with their district except for the Singletons. All right, we've got a few people here from, I got a couple from Yelm. They're gonna be keep going, it takes a minute. Okay, sounds good. Should be the four of us. Okay. Uh, but I thought it was just the two of us. All right, looking good. If they don't get sent, that tells me that their Zoom kicked them out and they were no longer part of my list. Got it. Let us know if we need to go visit a breakout room and then you can just toss us in there. Hi, Russell, this is Susie and I don't know if Trevor made it back, but he felt he was in the wrong breakout room. And it was just the two of us, so I came back. Uh, we, we went for breakout rooms with two or more people. Where's Trevor, where's Trevor from and what breakout room were you in, Susie, do you know? I cannot answer any of those questions. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. That's okay. It's it's all about the conversation, Susie. So Susie, did you leave Trevor all by himself? Yes. So I will join that and see where he wants to go. I'm sorry. We agreed to leave together. I, I see. You know. I'll be back. I see. Gotcha. <laughs> well, I was the only person in my room. So I left on my own accord and didn't let myself know it. So I'm back. Awesome. Uh, like, we'll likewise, in on Alaska, I was all by myself. Got a little lonely for about a minute. Well, uh, while Andrew uh, sets that up, I can sing all by myself. <laughs> Just to give us a little bit of space to be silly for a moment. We've been serious for a long time. Andrew will get you all set up. We'll set you up here in a moment. If you and, want to uh, kick the three of us into another room, we can chat. I, I appreciate that request. Um, do you find it fascinating that we say toss and kick and things like that when we're on a Zoom? Can you toss me into a breakout room? Kick okay. me into a breakout room? Do <laughs> you want to go to Which one do you want to go to? <laughs> Let's just put them, they, I don't think they mind where they go. They just need to go somewhere where they can talk with people. Those of you that are in the main room. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with that as well. So the nine, the nine that are in this room, four of us are unassigned. The rest of you have been assigned, so you're only able to go back to that breakout let's, room. But I can try to move you. Let's, uh, I mean, let's have a conversation here. There's only nine. I can move Boyce first. So Boyce, for where do you want to go? Just Chris. Send him. I would like to be in Hawaii. Oh, I, yeah. Can I join you. Okay. That's send, the bestest. Send, best send best Chris best. to send Chris to Grace Harbor. How about Ocasta? <laughs> yeah, that's they're very similar. <laughs> Chris, I'm going to send you beach. to Ocasta. Send him to the beach. All right. Okay, there you Chris. go, Chris. That's how you get to Hawaii. Do you? Um, Chris, oh. I think you have to click join, maybe. And then for Jeff, do we have another superintendent in a room that um, Jeff might be able to join that conversation? Just is there a superintendent interacting with their team? Do well, we notice? It depends on if it's going to send them or not. So I, it okay. didn't send me, Andrew. I don't have a click well, during the room. Let's let's have a conversation here. Let's yes. have a conversation here. Um, so Chris and Jeff, you you both are at the district leadership level, and um, I'm so we just want to open this section up for what does this make you think? What are the questions that rise to the top for you and your planning teams? 
I, I can tell you from our standpoint, uh, our biggest issue is still connectivity and the percent of our families and, and students that don't have access to internet. Our libraries are closed. Um, a lot of them don't have transportation from the upper reaches of our district to, to a hot spot. Um, we've discussed of purchasing and, and putting some hot spots out, but we have so many families that live off a, like a main highway that are back in the woods. We know that hot spots typically have a limit on distance. So it, it sounds like a lot of excuses, but that's been our reality. Uh, mm -hmm. In, in on Alaska, and I think for the most part in most of our Lewis County small schools, is the ability to connect with our families. And even those that do have internet, it, they don't have the um, capacity to have a, a Zoom going because it's just sporadic. So mm -hmm. all the stuff, all the things that you guys have provided in the previous hour plus, is is very helpful. It's been great. I'm going, to, I'm going to share a lot of those with our staff when we come back. But our our biggest issue again is going to be getting those, depending on what we look like on September 1st. But if we go even with a hybrid, we're going to run into the connectivity issue uh, because we have the Chromebooks to push out, which we did. Uh, but we're also getting we're also talking about. Uh, having teachers create lessons and downloading those on Chromebooks, either through a thumb drive and then providing and getting those to kids. So it's not, it won't be interactive, but at least they can get the content. So that, that's kind of a baseline of where we're starting if the connectivity doesn't improve, which I'm not I optimistic. See. Yeah. And, and then we're starting, it. we're starting with a similar piece because um, I have four teachers that don't have internet or cell service at their home. Mm -hmm. um, and, and another area in our school district, you can only be online live for 20 minutes a day maximum before you're capped out. So we figured, I bought cameras and updated our, our materials. So even those kids that are there, our teachers are going to try to record their lessons and put them on a CD disc and send those home um, with, with others. The, the part is how do we get them to them in a timely manner, um, moving a teacher to just be our technical person. But then when you have 14 kids per class, now do I need another teacher? Because um, mm -hmm. that's how many we can fit in each classroom given our square footage is 14. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of what ifs, but the piece that we run into is just like what, what uh, Jeff said is even with the greatest plan, we still have a great number of kids that yes, they can get on, they could get emails, but the live virtual teaching is not a reality for many of our families. So trying to be creative in our district to allow kids not to miss or when they do miss. Um, I actually had my staff here today and talked to them a little bit because they're anxious about getting together with the plan and so. You know, th that goes back to that competence equals confidence piece, right? So providing them with whatever solid pieces you can that you know, no matter how little. <laughs> um, so I th it sounds like one thing that um, the ESD could help with, with Brandon, um, who is kind of the hardware man for educational technology and just communications technology, is to ensure that we have all the right information to help us know that we've checked all the boxes for the possibilities of getting connectivity, right? Like uh, at one point, people didn't know that there could be hotspots delivered. Many people did, but many people didn't. And so now we're pretty much all able to check that box. But um, it sounds like we just want to make sure that- Russell, I think that's, that's where we run into in Lewis County. We had the ability to deliver it. But yeah. even if you had the hotspot in their house, they can't get connection. Yeah, that's what I hear. That's what I hear you saying. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, Can I ask a question? That's Susie. Yeah. Susie, where is where's CKSD? 
Central Kitsap over on the Kitsap Peninsula. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what systems are in place for special education in the in the different districts. We're not getting much coming down to us sped teachers and I'm in a DLP classroom. And so I'm just kind of curious. Um, do you mean systems yes, specifically for managing IEPs or do you mean systems like the ones that we talked about today? I'm uh, in person and on, yeah, and technological. No, I'm good with the IEPs, my end of it. That's not, but serving students mm -hmm. that um, are having difficulty Online. Yeah, your, your question tells me that the district hasn't made clear, at least to you, where they're headed with regard to streamlining technology and communications in the district as a whole. And so uh, um, I might, as a teacher, um, just start with my principal and ask, hey, has there been any word about what systems might be recommended or expected by the district in the fall? and that could get that uh, rolling. Um, there are popular systems that serve the four roles of the core four that many people are using, many districts I should say, are using around the state. Um, but Central Kitsap, we would encourage them um, to have the conversation as a district leadership team with their reopening group about the, the very topic of a core four, the very topic of simplifying on behalf of teachers, students, and parents so that we, we don't have too many systems in place. Um, that's, what, that's how I would answer your question. Hey, Russ. Yeah. Uh, two minutes is up. OK. I'm going to close the breakout rooms. All right. Okay, hey, we're welcoming folks back. Um, let's do this. I'd like you to type one word in your chat that describes your emotional state or feeling right now so we can see that people are here. They remember how to use the chat. We're just gonna watch for these words and then we'll invite questions. Tired, tired, depressed, oh, better. Yay, there we go. You feel googly, motivated, encouraged. Ready for summer, says Peninsula. Encouraged, motivated. Great to talk. It's always great to talk. All right. There's more people out there. There's 130 of you. Let's see. Let's jump in the chat. Some more words here. Grateful, inspired, motivated. Teamwork. Teamwork is going to be key, friends. Just key. Hopeful. Overwhelmed. Yes. Squim. There is a lot. There's a lot. We need to compartmentalize. Look at the tree that has that bears the fruit and grasp the fruit that is easy to grasp first. Let's see. Comparing notes. Communication. Key. Key. Communication. From district leadership to building leaders, building leaders to teachers, teachers to students and parents. Absolutely. All right. There's that. T taking it all in. Still processing. This will take a while to process. Best to do with a team. Camaraderie. Yes, absolutely. Ah, sunshine, you're bringing me a ray of sunshine with the one word, breathe, breathe, everybody. All right, let's do this. We can invite you to use the hand up or raise hand feature in uh, Zoom to indicate that you have a question from your room to pose to us. And uh, we hosts have the ability to look up and down the participant list to look for that little icon that says that you're raising a hand. So uh, just to tell you how to raise your hand, here's Jen. To raise your hand, you can go into the, I believe it's the chat. Um, and there is a option I'm looking at this. There will be some icons on the bottom underneath the participants list. If you click on participants, there is a yes, no, slower, go faster, and then there is more. 
Wait a minute. I'm explaining the other one. I'm going to go oh, back. You're, you're <laughs> It'll good. work. Um, but you can click on the thumbs up or the clapping to show that you have a question. Or you can click on reactions at the bottom of your tray, uh, at the bottom of your Zoom, and you can click either one of those as well. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, participants for sure. Participants. All right, um, I'm going to take some questions. Let's let's run through a few of these. Um, we're going to go with uh, Centralia. Mike, you're first. Kevin A. Cuff is on deck, and uh, Shelton Kelly, you are waiting in the hole. All right, so Centralia Mike, Kevin Acuff, and then Shelton Kelly. Mike? Our, our common theme was providing, our common theme was providing uh, equitable access, uh, not only to students, but to teachers. Uh, we noticed even in this, this uh, training that many teachers didn't have the ability to have video and sound at the same time. Um, so it's working out the ways to provide that access is, is and how we can possibly go about that and is, is there any help we can get for that right yeah that broadband piece of um, I think we've all been in a situation where somebody says oh I'm glitching I'm going to stop my video right and all of a sudden you can't see them um, you're right and then that removes a piece of the connection that we're making together yeah um, and sure yeah 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 absolutely Mike that's a big one big one Alma, Kevin. Yeah, um, we uh, are discussing about acquiring something like Canvas or a management system that is, uh, you know, besides Google to use as a home base. And we are curious what advantages there are in moving to that kind of a full management system versus using Google Classroom uh, as a home base. Andrew Hickman, you're on. Well, it really depends on the staff um, and the training and what grade levels you're thinking. So Canvas is typically designed for upper middle school through high school and college. It is the platform that is used by 93% of our colleges in Washington state. So having access to that for training purposes of students is beneficial. Um, Canvas and Google Classroom can do a lot of the same features. For example, you can post assignments in both. You can do quizzes in both. You can do discussions in both. You can instantly share resources. So there's a lot of the same features. One of the differences with Canvas is it can be a little more simpler to basically create your entire layout of your course as you move along. And it's a little easier to manage when it comes to, for example, due dates, grading, things like that. Both of them have perks. Both of them have differences. Um, I do have some districts that try to use Canvas in lower grades. It takes a massive amount of training to use Canvas in a lower grade because their intended audience is 612 or beyond. Um, so just be aware of that. It's doable, but you got, there's some pros and cons of all of it. That said, yep. Kevin, your your neighbor, one of your larger district neighbors, just a little bit further west, that does not rhyme with Schmaberdine, um, <laughs> has identified Canvas as an entire district platform, and they've been um, so they they've identified that. So so they're embarking on that journey. But Andrew's also providing some additional considerations, where you know a district might say hey, for ease and purpose, we might do this and ask our elementary teachers to take one step left. And we're gonna ask our secondary uh, teachers to take one step right. And, you know, they're, they're, that's just a consideration for the district. Another thing that's nice about both using things like Google Classroom and Canvas, the way they're designed, they do work together. For example, Canvas does have Google Drive capabilities where you can actually have Google Drive available same way Canvas does where you can instantly import resources and share things that way as well. So they do work compatibly. Um, and then I'm also getting questions in the chat around K2 and early elementary. Uh, the top five home bases in Washington, there was a survey that went out. So the top five that are being used 
are Canvas, Google Classroom, Schoology, Microsoft Teams, and Seesaw. So those are the top five LMSs that there will be training coming out around how to use within different classroom settings. Seesaw is intended for K2. I don't have a ton of experience with it. I'm learning myself. Um, Google Classroom does work beyond. So just know those are the top five. In Washington State, 117 school districts did identify Google Classroom as their primary home base. And then Canvas was second. Thank you, Kevin. All right, we've got Kelly from Shelton, and then I am looking for an additional hand. I had a hand from Wahilut Tribal School earlier. I don't see that hand still. We'll see if that person is invited back. Uh, Shelton Director Kelly. Hi, um, we have a question about providing professional development. We belong to EdTech Plus, which we love, and if everybody doesn't have it, you should. Um, so that part, is provided for us, but we're wondering about any resources or any direction you can give us on helping to provide funding for our teachers to actually put their time in to take these classes. Am I still on mute? I'm not on mute. Okay, Kelly. I do not know currently of additional funding that is being earmarked for the purpose of the additional training to help our staffs understand these systems. Um, I do know that conversations in district reopening teams are including a talking point around reprioritizing the topics we share as we come back and re-engage in school. So um, they're actually talking about, well, if we, when we have our all district day, in our individual building days in August as we're preparing for return, we probably need to re-look re at our agendas. B, within that conversation, I've had districts talking about providing asynchronous training content for teachers ahead of the return and reopening of schools so that the communication about support is we're preparing for return to school. We look forward to using these systems. Here are some links that you can click on to get, for example, a reminder for how to initiate Google Classroom, a reminder for how to record and post using Screencastify. So those are some of the conversations that I've heard and that we would certainly encourage. We, we understand that. We just feel that, and this is probably where everybody is, that this is going to take a lot of training for a lot of our teachers and we have staff here who want to do things really well and um you know helping make some of these decisions this has been extremely helpful what you've given out but finding the funding for it is going to be the barrier for a lot of us yeah yeah i think that some of those cbas are going to People will be weaving their way through the CBA language for sure, Kelly. Absolutely. You're spot on. Great. Thank you. Here is uh, Petrina Mullins from White Pass. You're on with a hand up. Trina? And Trina, I just saw her and I think she might be moving. Okay. There you go. All right. I, all right. Uh, well, I was trying not, I was just going to put a comment on the chat, but uh, I have been uh, utilizing uh, Canvas at the uh, community college level for a course that I was teaching for the last three years. And um, it's a lot, it's an extensive training to understand the ins and outs of how to utilize Canvas uh, more than what I believe that can be taught in a one day in service. So um, it, uh, when I first started with Canvas, I, it took 12 hours just to get introduced to all the uh, aspects of it through the college. And so as a secondary teacher, uh, you it, it's going to take more than just one day of training. And I 
just don't know how you're going to take teachers from zero to 60 with some of these programs without embedding some time for the some uh, professional development time for that. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's similar to you know I see, I hear your dovetail off of Kelly and um, certainly I I know that districts are looking at um, maybe earmarking some of their title funds for some of those training opportunities, um, uh, and it it is a balance. I'm not an expert in how to in I'm not an expert by any means of how to um, identify and then leverage those funds for those needs. Um, because I'm not in that work every day. Um, but I think you also bring up the issue of the amount of time it will take to provide the competence that is needed for people to have confidence. And I think that we can all agree that providing no training is a non-option. That's a non-starter. If we're asking people to utilize educational technology, it's incumbent upon us to provide them with the knowledge that will get them to the practice that we're asking for. Um, so that's that's important, and 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 you and Kelly are just spot on with they're not easy. Um, I am aware that uh, Canvas, when a district decides to invest in Canvas, there there are opportunities for the Canvas folks to provide training in an ongoing way. Um, so that's that's something that they provide there. Um, let's look at. Oh, Russ, had, can I add on for a minute? Yeah, yeah, jump in. I think that not only do we need to think about training, you know, and professional development for our teachers, but we also have to keep in mind that we have to have some way to get information out on how to use those platforms for our families um, and our students. And maybe when we have our students in a face-to-face -face setting, uh, whether that be a blended model or traditional, we need to do the, the work ahead of time there to train and help them be ready to use those tools. And I know that some people are sending out quick asynchronous videos to families on how to use some of the tools, the tech tools that we're asking them to use at home. But I just don't wanna forget about that component of making sure that we're also providing that information for our families and our students. Thank you, Lindsay. All right. You know, it, it's funny. See this little tool. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. I am holding my phone and some of you are texting me and I invite you to use the chat. <laughs> All right. Uh, Wahilu earlier had a hand raised we're, um, and they put a, a, a question in the chat box. So they had two questions, wondering specific platforms recommended for K2. One, one, one that we've mentioned already is Seesaw um that's designed for those lower grades um and then they, they, they were trying google classroom so it's good to listen to teachers when they're expressing the wrinkles that they encountered the challenges they encountered um, and then wondering if there are any surveyed benefits for increased engagement with synchronous distance learning um yeah so let's talk about uh, that for a moment because this this question of engagement is an important one. I have heard both these things. Distance learning caused us to see a dramatic drop in engagement after the first couple of weeks. I started with a high percentage and then it went down. But I have also heard that distance learning uh, once we announced that we were reinitiating school online. Okay, so think when we first closed schools, it was everybody, we pressing pause, just hold on, we'll get back to you. And then we got guidance in the continuous learning 2020 document from OSPI, and then districts reinitiated activities. When we reinitiated, I also heard that our engagement went up. And so we're all very interested in what do, what what was it that caused the engagement? And there are lots of factors there. Um, students that typically uh, were not verbally engaged in class, I've heard that they became very engaged over distance learning. Students who uh, were relieved of the burden of the grades and routine assignments uh, and the pressures that are presented socially 
in class, when, once relieved of those, flourished in the remote learning environment. But these are just um, these are just anecdotes. These are stories, and I think that what arises for me is just recognizing that we need to be on the lookout for the individual teacher needs that we can address on on teacher on the behalf of teachers, and we're asking them to be on the lookout for individual student needs. Um, an engagement isn't going to be, we have once a week a Zoom with the entire class and that's the only time I see you. Um, I think certainly it's blended. Uh, we hear a lot about teachers who are out driving the roads to, to knock on doors and see students face to face to make that relationship connection. Um, and I think that these blended models of those different ways to connect are one of the first conversations that need to happen. All right, let's go down. There are five new messages and I don't see any new hands. Remember folks, you can raise your hand in the chat. Let's see. Thank you. Boy, you guys are busy in the chat. This is starting to read like a like a novel. So Russ, I'm going to just add a quick comment. Um, yeah. The ones that we've seen regionally and statewide for K2 and early elementary are Google Classroom, Seesaw, Class Dojo, and Hapara. Those are what we have mainly seen for the younger elementary. Uh, some of them are paid, some of them are free. So just be aware of that. Um, and we do have regional districts that are using them. So just let you know. Yeah, great. I'm just reading these comments. I'm glad you're, you also, uh, the attendees are having a conversation and chat. Um, Andrew Hickman, can you have a student profile in your own classroom or do you have to have a separate email? I noticed that when I set up quizzes, I would try to take I would take it to try it out and then it would disappear. Do I need two separate emails to be able to view both views separately? Just for ease of use, I would recommend two emails. You can add yourself as a student. However, it will disappear eventually because it wants you have the teacher. Separate emails would allow you then to see the notifications exactly as students see them and yep. when they get sent out as well. Yep. So I would use a separate email. Now, the one thing with classroom, um, which is this is referring to, Classroom is designed to be used within your district. Um, that's how they did it. So it is most likely associated with your school emails. So if you want to have dummy accounts, which is what we do at the ESD for when I provide professional learning, have your IT support and always refer back to your IT and tech department, please always check in with them. Um, have them create a fake account or a fake email address for you to then access. And then you can train with it that way. That way doesn't mess up any other things or other people's emails. Right. The other thing I would just recommend with that, if you're trying to do these type of profiles, is make sure that when you're testing them out, you think about frequently, you think about what they are going to actually see, and if you have the parent report view turned on as well. And always talk to your IT department about what they would like. Mm -hmm. If you are trying to use an outside email, your district can turn it on to allow for personal emails to work in Google Classroom. However, there's the opposite end. For example, if I'm from Shelton and I want somebody from Tumwater to take my course in Classroom, both of you have to whitelist each other. Once again, IT department. If one of you whitelists on the IT side and the other one doesn't, you're not allowed in that classroom. It is very district specific. Allow me to address a topic that was raised that's very important in the chat up above, and that is the equity issue with regard to access to synchronous learning or even asynchronous content. Um, I think that when we think synchronous, we recognize that that's real time live, a real time live experience. And we lament the idea that not all students could participate in synchronous experiences. But what part of what we're doing and where a synchronous experience starts is it starts with establishing relationship and connection with students. So synchronous video is only one part of the entire um, of the entire plan for how you will connect and establish relationship with students. 
So if you're in a hybrid model, you will have an opportunity to connect with students live because they'll cycle through your building. If you're exclusively remote, this becomes an issue, but then you employ these other strategies like having folks drive out and make the personal connection at the door. And so it's absolutely an issue, but synchronous video is only one piece of the communications mix. And synchronous video, as we mentioned, it was just a mention, um, appropriate practice, <laughs> and this is one thing that our team re was reminded of the other day, says that synchronous video is not meant to introduce new topics and relate new thinking. It is meant to reinforce, reflect, expand upon, and regard items that have been presented asynchronously. So thinking about the purpose of asynchronous and synchronous can also help your team plan for routines, routines of assessment, routines of student connection and relationship. So thank you for that topic. It's so important. We want to look at all these things with an equity lens. It can be very um, problematic and uncomfortable because someone in the room needs to constantly be saying, what are we doing for our students who do not have connectivity? What are we doing for our students and families who did not respond to our district survey and we know we don't have their voice represented in our decision making? Somebody has to be that voice so that the team as a whole, the district as a whole, moves forward um, recognizing the need for that equity lens. All right, let's see. I see no other hands at this time. I'm looking for embedded questions in the chat. There's and one last question in the chat, Russ. Okay, what is it? Um, and it's looking at the how teachers could balance the students who are attending the classes and then moving on to lessons when they haven't seen the, the or had opportunity to experience the other lessons um, going forward. So um, I'm going to try, I'm going to take a minute and I'm going to try to find some links maybe okay. to put in the chat for that question. Just want to let yeah. Jeff know I'm working on it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I think for district level planning, this is a question that uh, they're trying to wrap their heads around because districts are facing a situation where a certain portion of the student body will be willing to return to the building. A certain portion of the student body uh, is likely to not be willing to return to the building, but they don't want to leave the district. And so um, one of the planning conversations that, that, that people are having is addressing that need. Um, to find ways to reach students that will not come, uh, as well as students who will come. And uh, that question that, that Jen related has to do with establishing rhythms of uh, delivering lesson content, formative assessment, communications. So, what I would encourage building leaders to do is engage their teams, their teacher teams, in a conversation around, all right, um, when we are going to need to become better collaborators more than ever. And so uh, let's talk about perhaps even going so far as to say, might there be one person who communicates to everyone uh, via email weekly. It only comes from one of the teachers on the team, but we're all providing the same instruction that week. And I mean, that's just a place to start that conversation, but finding rhythms um, that teachers can follow uh, is, is going to be important. And then giving them the confidence that when they're engaged in those rhythms, they're doing the right thing, right? You're always continuous improvement, but being able to say, thank you so much for that email. I've been watching them. You've been doing that regularly. Thank you so much for sharing with me the, the, the wrinkles that we're having with the Joneses. I, I, thanks for bringing them to our attention. We want to drive out there. Just rhythms of, of all these things.
Can I speak to that a little bit too, Russ? Yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the things that is easy for us to track with our online and our tech tools is the number of students participating in that. I can look down in this meeting and see that there's 120 participants right now. And so something else to consider might be how do we track that communication and those connections for students that don't have access? Um, did something get mailed out to that student? Did someone drop off the choice form or choice board on paper when it was meal delivery time? Um, but thinking about how can we track what we're providing to those students that don't have that connectivity or that aren't willing to come to school face to face because they're too concerned. Um, and I've heard a lot of great ideas via regular mail, meal drop offs, those kinds of times. And I would also encourage people to think about what are we doing within our tech tools that we can easily transfer to paper or the thumb drives with uh, Chromebooks that we can easily get to those students that don't have access. Um, so the tracking system and how can we work smarter to provide those opportunities to mm -hmm. students. Thank you for, for that, Lindsay. That's, that's an awesome extension of the answer. Uh, I wanna speak to Kent, teacher Jeff, and, and his very, very important contribution from 1124 in the chat box. Uh, considering Common Core standards guidance on what each grade level student should know by the end of the year, how do we address the reality of some students participating and having more access th than others? And how as teachers do we deal with that day to day? For example, say 14 of 21 students participate. How do you move on to the next lesson as planned the next day? Consider also that one student who missed previous day is now present today and is now short on info needed to be successful today. Um, you know, Jeff, I think that one thing that you're reminding us of is uh, a teacher's desire to keep students engaged in a timely way and to, uh, and we struggle as teachers with the feeling that a student may be falling behind um, and just like we have a student who may be absent for four days and then returns and we're struggling with catching that person up, I think that we face the same challenges in this environment when a student may miss a key synchronous session. Um, that's, so I'm reading this and I'm reading it as if I am engaging in uh, remote teaching and students are engaging in distance learning, then these questions are very important. One of the, the, the foundational pieces of a, of a lesson plan is to, is to access prior knowledge at the outset of a lesson. And so uh, I, I think that with this issue, it brings me back to the pieces that uh, are embedded within a quality lesson. And we're going to have to be more deliberate about accessing prior knowledge and addressing the most important enduring standards in these content areas. So uh, I talked a little bit earlier today about the teachers are gonna need to move through a protocol to, to, to sift through these ELA standards for reading, writing, listening, speaking, and they're going to have to do a protocol. And there, there is one available. You can just use Uncle Google to find it, for example to identify what are the, uh, call them essential standards, call them focus standards, call them key standards. And we're just gonna have to give up some pet projects that we've done in the past because we will not have time for them to happen if we're in school, out of school, hybrid. It, it's simple as that. And it will help teachers, I think, focus on what is absolutely critical. It will make them think about every minute that they're going to interact with students. It'll make them think all the way down to the level of the words they say. Because I tell you what, we will have been on this for two and a half, maybe three hours, and many of you have already reached capacity. You reached capacity earlier. How, how, how quick is it for a student to reach capacity on a Zoom? So I, 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 for one, have a hard time imagining people leaning on 
whole group, all classroom Zoom sessions where you're trying to teach. What I do imagine is people leaning on whole group, all class Zoom sessions to break them out in, to, to, to play with ideas, to elicit feedback, to elicit conversation, to, to really go for the engagement. So Kent, thank you very much for the question. Those are some, some things to think about in that space. Okay, I'm looking for anything else. Nobody has posted since 1131. All right, whoever would like to unmute and pose a spontaneous question, we invite you to do so. Uh, I have one uh, spontaneous question that I haven't really heard discussed. Maybe this isn't the forum for it. But um, what type of, I mean, I've used uh, technology in the past like iReady to help assess students uh, when they come back into school. But it seems to me that none of us really know where our students are from a grade level perspective, actually. And Making that assessment, I think, is going to be critical to any curriculum layout we do, whether we use online technologies or resources going forward. So just want some suggestions there uh, from you. Um, you know, I raise a pretty expensive program for a district to um, purchase, uh, but it does do a, a pretty good job of uh, making some good grade level assessments and assigning online tutorials. Is there any help coming forward uh, from a budgetary perspective to help um, support those kinds of initiatives? Oh, all right. So you, you, you had one question in the first half and then you tagged on the budget question at the end there, Ned. Uh, so there's two, there's two questions. Um, I, I am not aware of uh, any earmarking or, or budget to, to assist in that area. Um, but I can say that locally districts, you're right, they make the decisions about what systems they invest in to do that diagnostic testing, um, like iReady and then help students move forward. And, and uh, iReady is a powerful one, holy moly. Um, I think that at the heart of what you're talking about is how will teachers assess uh, a student's level as they return to school and then um, what might be some other ways that in an ongoing fashion, we continue to check for understanding and progress. Um, I might add in the essential standards that our department or team has identified. Um, and I think that's at the heart that you're, you're talking about a teacher's desire to meet students where they are and then help them move forward from where they are. Um, and uh, iReady is, is one way to assist in that. Uh, it, is, it is my feeling, and I'll, I'll invite anyone to jump in after this. It is my feeling that the essential standards conversation has to happen first, and then the team looks at their traditional scope and sequence for a typical year when everyone's on site, and they look for the markers of the essential standards they've identified in their scope and sequence from a typical year, and they pick those pieces out, and then they conceptualize how that would be delivered in a hybrid or remote learning model. Because if we're all on site at any given time, congratulations, everybody knows how to do that. But we can't have remote learning 2.0 look like remote learning 1.0 and a hybrid model is a new adventure. So anybody else want to jump in on that? Once again, I think that it's identify essential standards, then look at your scope and sequence for the year. Um, and what I'm talking about folks by scope and sequence is what does the arc of the year for our calendar and planning with units and lessons and assessments look like traditionally, typically? because we're not gonna deliver that if we're hybrid or, or fully remote. It, it's gonna be something else. And how do we identify the presence of the essential standards in the work that we typically do? And then how do we uh, address that with the model of our teaching? So that's my proposal and I invite anybody else to jump in. Yeah, I just, 
I just want to add um, one of the things around assessment and what we are assessing that has come out a lot in a lot of this distance learning work um, is asking us to think differently about what we're asking teachers to really assess. And so content standards is, is absolutely one of those things that we need to have our pulse on in terms of where students are at. But we also want to be looking at how can we assess those content practices? How can we assess mathematical practices, reading and writing practices, science practices, in terms of how students are thinking and how they're reasoning and how they're accessing and making sense of content? And I think when you, when you can't get as much concrete data around the specific priority standards, I mean, you, that means you, you do have to pare those down. You have to look at what's really important there. But I think that teachers will have more success looking at how are students engaging with content? What are their reasoning skills? What are, what are those practices? And how are we fostering and assessing those things through these kinds of models? Thank you for that add-on. Anybody else want to jump into that space? Okay, I'm looking at Natalie from Sumner, and she's wondering about where incoming students will be as well. Uh, thinking a lot of review from the previous year will need to be done, especially the younger grades. Um, Natalie, I, I don't know if what I'm about to say will bring you comfort or, or not, but um, there will be some guidance from the state about how important it will be and how we might go about um, determining what is needed to review. So helping teachers wrap their heads around, okay, how much of last year's content should I expect to review? How should I be thinking about that with my team? So um, I, I hope it brings you ease it brings me ease. Adna teacher Corey, uh, accurately assessing based on what students produce. Some students have no help and some have parents who are helping feed them answers. Any suggestions for accurately gauging gained student knowledge? Uh, Adna teacher Corey and everybody else, I, I think that um, you hear me kind of walk questions back to something that is much more broad. And in this case, I'm going to do it again. And that is, uh, I would hope that I am able to regard student actions and parent actions and teacher actions first and foremost with a lens of uh, they, they I'm, I'm assuming best intent, assuming best intent. So you know what, if I know that a parent is doing some student's work um, I am likely still going to praise the aspects of the work that is being done um, just like I would normally uh, because um, I want to assume best intent. <laughs> and you know what? Most of our parents are not trained to be teachers. I think that's something that we've, we've also found out. And uh, those of us who are parents, we, we have wrestled with um, adding the teacher hat at home uh, so I, I think that you've identified a key issue um, in the desire to accurately assess where students are so that you can then respond to move them forward continuously. And I think that it starts with you have to know your students as individuals in order to gain access to uh, just knowing um, how, to how to meet them where they are. If you don't know them as individuals, if they're just another face in the room, then we start to make assumptions. We want to know about them. So I think that this year we're definitely going to see the start of the year where um, we'll have a lot of social emotional activities going on and we'll just do a lot of inquiries about how are you, where are you, how's it going, Districts and schools are going to be collecting, again, information about connectivity and computers and things like that uh, in case we have to lean on them. All right. One thing okay. I've, I've yep. seen teachers do to rest, especially at the younger grades, uh, is offer some individual meetings during office hours yeah. or 
Um, but it really brings to light student understanding if you can get some of those students in individual yeah. meetings too. And sometimes they feel more comfortable participating. Yeah, and an individual meeting isn't just on Zoom, my friends. An individual meeting is knocking on a door and having a conversation. Um, an individual meeting is seeing somebody come through um, the food line. An individual, you see what I'm getting at is that they're, they're, we need to also engage in creative ways to uh, see people, certainly, to get the information we need as teachers. I, I just hear so many of your comments are, you as teachers, you yearn to elicit the best potential from your students. That's just what I hear. It's, it's what you're about. I mean, that's why you're a teacher. All right. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Just to add on to that. Um, so that's also part of the reason, part of the justification for why we allow students to post video as their assignment, right? When we, we can't be face to face with students, having them post a video where they're describing their own thinking um, allows you much better insight into where that student's at than just submitting an assignment. Um, and there are some apps that, that do that and even at younger grade levels are, are very easy to use and very easy to submit. So be thinking about how to use that asynchronous submission video um, as a tool for, again, it's almost a personalized meeting um, where you're getting some one-on-one -on -one time with how that student is thinking. Uh, Mr. Acuff, go right ahead. Hey, thanks, Russ. Um, so I, during uh, Chris Rakedahl's webinar yesterday, I wondered if anybody heard that did he, I heard him talk about the distinction between uh, ALE and doing distance learning. And it seemed like he did not answer that question. Am I correct in saying that? About whether funding would happen, about whether you'd be responsible for all of the ALE requirements. For instance, uh, I'm, I'm sure many districts are, are likely to have parents that say, I'm not gonna wear a mask, I'm not coming to school. And so if we had um, X number of students in that situation, are we, subs, uh, are we subject to the, to the ALE requirements or because of this, this situation, will we not be subject to them? And I don't know if he answered that or not. In his June 8 webinar, I heard him unequivocally say no. So I'm, I'm going to look at my scripted notes. I was unable to tune in yesterday. So perhaps someone else who was tuned in can speak to what they heard briefly while I just go check my notes from June 8, okay? Anybody and else? The other thing, yeah, well, I was just gonna say that somebody asked if there was a funding source. He did say yesterday that the CARES Act money that they were going to be using for uh, possibly getting a, a, a unified management system or remote learning to places that didn't have remote learning and they're not going to be able to use that money for that purpose, at least this summer. So there's no help with regard to any of this, these things financially as of right now anyway. Okay. And Russell? I know, T yes, yes. Uh, this is Alex Apostle. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, consistent with your message and the message from the other presenters so far this morning, there was a statement made uh, in, re in respect to student assessment, do no yeah. harm. Right. And that echoes, um, uh, that's echoed uh, for me throughout this presentation in various ways. And I think th that we should extend this philosophy, not only in terms of students and grading and assessment, but in terms of our staff, because they're being pushed really right. Um, both administrators and, and teachers and classified staff were being pushed real hard here in terms of starting school. There's, there was the first transition when we, when we stopped schools, and now we're being asked to go into a different transition, a different level. And the issue of training and, and doing things right comes to mind. Mm -hmm. And as we move forward, and I'm hearing that we're not going to have any resources to really spend on training our staff during the summer, that is troublesome for me and I know for my colleagues. Mm -hmm. So the issue of do no harm <laughs> in terms of staff and students and right. families really comes to bear to me. Absolutely. Right. I mean, 
I think that when we ask our teachers to embrace what that means on behalf of students, we're also asking our building leaders to embrace what that means on behalf of teachers. Right. I think you're absolutely right. Um, so that's why part of one of the first things I did was propose that reopening teams of principals and assistant principals at the district level really talk about how they can help teachers be calm and confident that their practice won't be scrutinized in a way that's damaging, <laughs> right? Right. We, if you're gonna be in a hybrid or remote model, we're still going to be evaluating your teacher practice because that's law, but we wanna reassure you that we know it looks different and here as a district is what we'll be looking for, right? Sure. Um, so I think that that's really important. Thanks for bringing that up. I, Thank you. I think it has to do with the, the plumb line that we drop from the district mission, vision, and goals that runs right from the top of the district through our buildings, all the way down through teachers, all the way to students and community, right? Those, those, those connections. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Yeah, Kevin Acuff, I found my notes and here is my, here is the quote uh, from Chris from um, June 2nd. There are families that will be hesitant to return to school, but they don't want to leave the system and local decisions will have to be made. We need to figure out whether this is a handful of folks or a larger group within the community and pair that with the number of staff who may not return as well. So, can teaching and learning be remote? Yes, and it does not have to be an ALE because ALE comes with writing in individualized learning plans for students and a lot of other baggage. So those are my scripted notes from Chris on June 2nd, but I don't know if he updated those comments yesterday. I can just tell you what I have. Thank you for that. You betcha. All right, folks, any other spontaneous questions? I see Aberdeen CTE direct, nope. That's not the one. Hey, there's a there's a comment. It's actually more of a challenge. Um, it is. Challenging question to think about from Susie from Shelton. Um, that, that really just asks about, you know, what about those students who have no access to video, who have five other family members and they're the oldest and they're taking care of their family members and, and you know, and just challenging us to really kind of think about equity. Um, a year ago, I was a high school math teacher in the classroom still. And I think back to some of those students and I, I think to myself, you know, we had these conversations before. We, we were asked to think about, well, what about that high school student who can't do their algebra homework because they're at home taking care of kids every day after school or who misses every Friday because there's no parent home to take care of the students on that day because both are out working. Um, or who doesn't have access to the technology that, that they're being asked to use in the classrooms and they're missing and they're gone. So they, they have no way of making that up. Um, and I would just say, what, what would we have done for those students then? Um, this, this challenge of equity isn't new, um, but I think in, our, in what this has done is it's really shed a light on those students who always had those challenges. And now we're really, really forced to really think about how to respond to those students. And so I would just say, what would you have done before? How would you have accessed those students and reached those students? And how can we think about that now, knowing that they've always had these challenges? And how can we respond to that? Thank you. I'm going to say for a teacher, the question that is the compelling question that our leaders need to share with the teacher is, how can I hear each student's voice? How can I hear each student's voice? Especially if we're hybrid and remote. And then in the decision making processes at the district level, how do I ensure that I hear the voices? of the right groups as we're making decisions on behalf of people who may not be here. So how do we ensure that all voices are, are part of our key decisions? That is, that, is an av that is one of the avenues to equity, equity-based decision-making. Um, I can tell, for those of you who are district and school leaders, uh, there are many districts around the state that have been uh, sending surveys to parents 
um, about their levels of engagement and what they're willing to do for next year. And one of the realities of sending surveys is to understand that the information that informs your decisions is only as good as the information that you receive back from your community. And let's be honest, it is typical that you do not receive as much reply to surveys from families that are typically marginalized. So one of the challenges for us as we're engaged in this new era of decision making is to think beyond the typical survey for how we can, in, how we can plan uh, with, with data and input from voices that we haven't heard, that have been silent. All right, let's see what else we got. Um, Jen Flo put my question. It's not new, says Shelton High School counselor and SEA president Susie Honecker. Wow. Fantastic last name, Susie. Can you unmute? And I I'd can. like to be able to. I'd like to be able to pronounce your name correctly first of all. Um, but I'd like to just have you uh, pose this thought to the whole group, please, verbally. Oh, absolutely. I'm. Um, it's Honaker Wurz Bicky. I know, right? A lot. Um, uh, my comment is mostly just saying that if we go back and we look at what we did when we had challenges of equity in the classroom before, and we took steps. I would say that our progress has been some, but it's definitely not what we're happy with. And so we need to use this opportunity of time to not just say, what did we do? But say, what can we do differently now? Who can we reach differently now? What kind of voice, how will we know if we've heard voices? Um, how will we know because we'll be hearing them and we're used to hearing them. So uh, a big challenge for equity, big challenge that our old thinking is not gonna make for new growth. Right. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. You're right. You know, in the context of today, ed tech and continuous learning, you know, we've seen that tech can help facilitate those relationships, those connections. Um, it, it can also present a challenge because it, it might create inequity. If we are only relying on one way to build relationship and communicate, that's another challenge. Um, all right, excellent. Let's see, looking for any other questions. Any other spontaneous folks who want to ask a question? Because we're, we're leading up to the last minutes and we're going to say goodbye to everyone in just a couple minutes. So it's your last chance. All right, well, what we do at the end of Zoom sessions these days to, uh, I encourage you now to click on gallery view in the upper right portion of the, the black part of your screen, gallery view instead of speaker view. So if you see my face really big right now, then you don't want that. That's bad. It's bad for you and your health. So click on gallery view. And what we're going to do to sign off is everybody's just going to wave just like this. This is celebration. I see you. I see you. I'm so glad you're here. I see you. Thank you for joining us. We're gonna shut down the Zoom in a couple minutes. Thank you for coming. The second half, your questions are so compelling. I'm encouraged and I appreciate you all. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you, Russell. You bet, bye-bye. Right. They continue to log off. Let's uh, see. Here's Donald here's Duck was in the session today. That's great. Yeah, look at him. You know, Arthur, you, you've been joining he, us a lot. Yeah, he doesn't give up. Look at him. Bye, I'm everyone. Right. I'm pretty sure that what Harvey does is he somehow mystically clones himself and he's in about three or four different Zooms at a time every day. Everywhere <laughs> I go, there's Harvey. Hey Russ, I, I wondered if uh, like it. Uh, you guys could uh, create some kind of a document. And I, I looked in, uh, if everybody fills out the, the, you know, reopening schools template that is online, then this question will be answered. But if that's not filled out, then I would be interested in knowing who is using what in terms of Canvas. I would be interested in knowing what are the models of remote instruction that are being provided for what I'm gonna call homeschool students instead of uh, ALE students. In other words, parents who either because they don't want a student to wear a mask 
or because they're afraid that their student will pass on the disease, do not want to come to school. And I will guarantee you that schools of our size and Adna and Wahilu, uh, that we would really, really profit from knowing what some bigger districts are doing around this um, that we could create without having to um, completely reinvent the wheel. Obviously, Chris's idea about using people that are in high risk categories is a great idea if they match up with their technology expertise, um, at least the capability of getting that technology expertise. Uh, so anyway, those the, I, the, I just had some thoughts and, and we're gonna be confronting that as we're doing a lot of planning in the very, very short term. Um, and our, I didn't go check, Andrew, this question's for you. Um, I definitely am thinking that we would um, become a member of the ed tech for the coming year. Just, I mean, if you're ever going to do it, this is the time to do it, right? It seems, seems like it would be dumb not to do that for this next year. Yeah. Um, so uh, are the, uh, is, is there, are there any differences with the levels that are unique to this COVID year? We, there are, we, uh, we completely changed it. So it is now no longer levels. You're either all in or just the media resources. And the all in includes registration, for example, to kickstart and any other events we have, as well as continual coaching throughout the year, things like that. So and uh, Kevin, if you want to host events at your district, just let me know. We can do that. I'm posting, Kevin, the cost for Elma School District based on a student count of 1,612, which was found in the Washington State Report Card. And I'm sending you a private chat right now. And we redid the pricing structure and it made it more equitable across all districts is the way I'm going to phrase it. Um, most the cost went down. I'd say 99% of them, the cost went down. So, okay. So there you go, Kevin. That's what it would be for all in. And let me just go back over and show you what that includes. I'm going to display that while somebody else may want to pose a verbal question. Let me just grab that slide, okay? And I'll display it. Sure. Anybody else with question before we go? We got to let our team go. They have some additional responsibilities to take care of. So uh, last minute question, it's got to be a quick one. All right, Andrew, can you start uh, removing people, yeah. uh, dismissing people? And Kevin here, I'm going to show this for you. I'll share this. Let me go to presenter view. Uh, is that in presentation view, Daniel? Yes, you're good. Yes. Okay, good. So those are for the EdTech Plus. So it's the entire district, all staff receive all benefits. Okay. And it's as soon as you say, yeah, we're going to commit to that. I'll, I'll get the ball rolling. So uh, I know you guys have had ton of Google Classroom trainings in the past. Have you uh, also done Canvas trainings? Yes. Oh, you have? Well I done. Do. Okay. And we also do, so I've, this past spring and this summer, I've also transitioned to make it both live options as well as asynchronous through Canvas. So most of the trainings are also virtual now if your staff want to take it on their own time versus a scheduled time. Then the way I've been doing that, for example, with Shelton, I'll give a sample they had pretty much their entire staff take the online Google Classroom Canvas. And then they had follow-up coaching with me where I then worked with staff and answered questions and helped them prepare their courses. So learning first, kind of flip classroom model, then move forward with individualized training for what they need. Okay. Thank you all. Appreciate the help and yeah. support. It was very good. So it looks like Superintendent Forrest is on the phone and on our Zoom. I just, oh, there he goes. Guys, see you later. Oh, I'm removing uh, people. <laughs> awesome. Bye. Hey, it's just us, right? Confirming just us. It just is us. now 12.04. Yeah. We got them out of here pretty good. Stop recording. <laughs>